It's the Experience Action Podcast, and I'm your host, Jeannie Walters. This is my favorite episode of the month because it's time for CX Pulse Check, where me and a special co-host talk about recent things in the news that impact customer experience and what you can learn from it. I am so excited about our co-host this month. It is the one and only Tamson Webster. Tamson, hello. Hello. How are you, Jeannie? <laughs> I am great. I'm so thrilled you're here. And for those very few people who might not be aware of you and your work, I would love for you to share a little bit about what you do and who you are. Sure. So I'm Tamsin Webster, literally the only one. That's kind of fun. <laughs> um, uh, I am a message designer by trade. I am the founder of the Message Design Institute, and I have spent the bulk of my 25 plus year career trying to answer the question about how can we accelerate the understanding and adoption of new ideas. Excellent. And for those of you who have not followed Tamsin forever, like yours truly, uh, then I would recommend you, you follow on LinkedIn, you go and look up her work around the red thread and you have a new book. I do. And there it is right and here. There it is. Look at that. Look, it's, it's already flagged. Love that. I, it is already flagged. <laughs> um, and I've barely started it, but this is one of my favorites. When two truths fight, mm. only one wins. That, Thank I mean, you. Yeah. There, there is a lot of power in this book because I think everybody right now is really trying to figure out communication in a different way, trying to figure out how do we make sure that we get our message across and how do we do it in a way that people can really not only hear it, but act on it and remember it for yes. a long, long time. So That's right. Yeah, this is it's it's really, really exciting. So well, thanks. Yeah, I, I am excited to get it out into the world. It it just really struck me in all the years that I've been doing this, you know, branding, messaging, all, change communications, uh, organizational communications, how often just change broke at the at the communication <laughs> part. Um, yeah. And I just I've been ever curious about that and kept kind of working backwards up the line. So it's like started in marketing. Okay, maybe it's the brand. Maybe it's this mm -hmm. thing. Maybe it's this thing. Maybe it's this thing. <laughs> and then fundamentally, I got to the core of where I think a lot of it is, which is that fundamentally to you know, use a quote that I quoted in my first book from Agatha Christie, that words are only the outer clothing of ideas. And mm. I think a lot of times it, for, for good reasons, because of how our brains are wired, we kind of forget why we actually believe that a new initiative or a change or a practice that we're trying to put in place for our organizations, why it is that we really believe like in our, mm -hmm. in our core, why that it's the right decision. And the more I have found that people have been able to articulate that, the more successful all the other things, all the other forms of communication and the implementation as it mm -hmm. shows up in experience and how your clients and customers experience that, it, it can have a transformational effect on all of it. Absolutely. And I think change management and customer experience go hand in hand because yes. a lot of what we're doing is trying to change behavior and outcomes within the organization in order to deliver that. So I highly recommend that my CX leaders out there go check out that book. Thank and you. I also wanted to kind of dive into this idea of how connected communication is in general with customer experience. And with, yes. <laughs> you yeah. know, I've done, I don't know how many customer journey mapping sessions at this point, and every single one has a communication breakdown, every single one that we discover and that we have to do something about. Yes. And so it's so connected. And I think sometimes we overlook that. We think that experience is this big idea or a big thing, but it's really about all these small moments and it's really about delivering what you promise and all of those yeah. things. So yes. speaking of delivering what they promise. Yes, let's do it are in an era with a lot of us receiving those letters in the mail or those phone calls telling us there's been fraud on the bank mm -hmm. account or the credit card. And this first article that we pulled up here is from Business Wire. And it's really about, um, I, I'm going to read it. And it's not the, <laughs> it won't sound great on audio. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I do see ink and payments, which is P-Y-M-A. 
NTS survey reveals consumer expectations for how banks respond to credit card fraud. Mm -hmm. And what stood out to me about this is that, first of all, it's so prevalent. 25% mm -hmm. of customers deal with some sort of fraud on a regular basis. And the fact that we all know that experience. Yep. And I think that part of what you know we want to do as customer experience leaders is be as proactive as we can be. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, we have to react and we have mm -hmm. to react really quickly. So I'm just curious, like this talked about, you know, how important that proactive communication was and how if we don't deliver on that, we actually erode trust pretty quickly. So any thoughts on this? What what did you oh, see? Oh gosh, so many. Um, well, I think that so it's it yes the the proactivity is this idea i think it comes into this place where we have this expectation as humans that we're experts in our own stuff and other people are experts in theirs and how i think that matters here is that if i trust this you know if i trust my bank to manage my credit then I'm I'm essentially trusting that they know more about how to keep that money and how to keep those mm -hmm. transactions transactions protected than I do. So that moment where if I have to go and say I think there's fraud here and they haven't they mm -hmm. haven't adjusted for that, it it does as you say it's a it's an extraordinary violation of that trust because it's like well, what am I even doing this? Like what are you even yeah. doing if you're not paying attention to this? You're supposed to be the expert. Yeah, And I think where this can really go hand in hand and kind of the broader thought that that came up for me as I was I was reading this was I think a lot of times in customer experience and linking it back to that communication piece, I think sometimes we think so much about the create the experience that we want to create for our customers and clients that we forget to account for the experience they've had to date. Mm. Meaning there is, you know, so you can say that you're proactive or whatever, but like what's actually going to count for them long term is what their repeated experience, actual experience is there. And so I think that that's both where that desire for proactivity comes from, but also I think more of a where the practical diagnosis can come in from a from a company standpoint to say, OK, well, how like what are they bringing to the table? Like, because it, their, their, their experience with fraud, their experience with credit and all of this doesn't start the, uh, usually at the moment they open an account with us, right? Mm -hmm. There's all this other stuff. So how can we account for that, validate it, and create a different experience for them based on what they're walking in with? And I think it's a really important point that um, often when I'm working with different organizations, we kind of act like our customers are waking up inside of our journey, right? Like they, <laughs> they're like, I? oh, I How did I get here? here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. I'm going to plan my whole day around going to the bank. And of course, yep. that's not reality. We have to remember, like, these are whole people who have had whole Ooh. lives. Oh, yes. And yes. they, you know, they're trying to accomplish something. And I think one of the things that this article got me thinking about was just how easy it is to kind of become complacent. Mm. And one of the things that they talked about was, you know, how do we not uh, create alert fatigue for customers where mm. we're saying like everything is a crisis because we want to be, we want to communicate all the time with them and be yeah. transparent. But at the same time, not everything is the same level of crisis and not everything needs their attention in that same way. So I think yes. your point about we trust you to know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so reassurance, I think, is mm. really important and being proactive about that reassurance. But I think we also have to really think strategically about the what ifs. What if we yeah. have fraud? What if we uh, have, uh, you know, our phones are down? What if all of these things? And you have that plan so you can just kind of turn it on when you need it instead of scrambling. Yes. Oh, I love that point that you're making, Jeannie, about uh, we think that they've just walk, wait, woken up in our experience. <laughs> and, and and when you started to talk about the alerts, that that and my brain went to two places at once. Not unusual. Number <laughs> one, how the the newspaper apps and the and the news apps violated that. Right. Mm. Like I, I remember growing up 
like watching broadcast TV, if there was an interruption of breaking news, it was something legit big, yes. right? Like, yes. and it was like, I, I've got a train, like I had, like, it took me a long time to like lose the like trained in anxiety response of like yep. a breaking news alert. And then, and then the news apps and they're, they all do it. So we're not yeah. going to say it's one or the other as just absolutely, I think, violated that experience of now everything is like breaking news. Yep. We've got paella. And they're like, <laughs> dude, that is not breaking news. Like yep. these two things are not equivalent. So the reason why I bring that up is because again, thinking about the experience that your clients or customers bring to you, mm -hmm. how does the experience you're creating it's not, as you say, it's not in a vacuum. It's in a, it's in with everything else, which yeah. means if they're already getting too many silly alerts from, from email, from social, from their news apps, and then you are just pinging with like, Hey, act now we've got a new APR rate. And you're like, y'all, yeah. like <laughs> the thing is, is like, it's, it's about, this is one of those opportunities to be different and valuable, meaning mm -hmm. we're only actually going to reach out to you when it's absolutely necessary, because that way you're actually training in a yeah. good way. You're conditioning your, your clients and customers to pay attention rather than to ignore you. Right? That's right. That's and right. that I think is, it's a product of really looking at like, what is the rest of the experience that they're bringing in in any given moment? Yes. And I'm going to put this out to the universe just because it's some, it's a request from me to all the banks <laughs> out there. Yeah. Because as a small business owner with business banking, um, I can't tell you how many months I look at my statement and there's something that says something like statement fee. Mm. And I have to call to say, what is this? And they say, oh, that's because you, it's a wire fee or it's this or it's that. Perfectly logical explanation. Could you but just define it. Just right. put, it, put like, a glossary on the page. Why are you making me, yeah. why are you making me call your people yeah. who sometimes have to look it up or whatever? Oh. It just like, it drives me bananas. So I'm putting that out to the universe. I love that. <laughs> and that's a solvable problem, Jeannie, as right? far as I'm concerned to either print it like, you know, Hey, useful terms. It goes yes. right. Like right in the kind of like the grade back text, or if you're getting an online statement, anything is like hyperlinked to an yeah. explanation. So you can like, what is this? Oh, right. No. Exactly. Or just yeah. call it what it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because when we don't call things what they are, we can't help but doubt them, right? Because, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that humans are wildly attuned to intent and trust mm -hmm. is a product of perceived capability. How good are you at this thing that you're saying that you can help me with or that you have contracted with me to help mm -hmm. me with? And what is your intent? And so, the thing is, so when you're pro when a when a company like a bank is proactive, it's like that builds that capability. Like, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, you caught this before I even did. And I think most of us would rather it be flagged as fraudulent, and it isn't, than the opposite happens, yes. right? Yeah. But then the second thing happens with intent is like when you withhold information, or it feels like you are withholding information. Well, then, given again past experience to date with other companies, other corporations, mm -hmm. etc., other experiences of people withholding information, many of us have very negative associations with when we have to go find something out, right? That's right. And That's so right. it's about getting ahead of those assumptions, those beliefs, those that past experiences may have created in your customers, even if they weren't with you. Right. This is how you have an opportunity to really set yourself apart and to also live the values that you mm -hmm. say that you're there for. Amen. All right. Okay. We've solved banking. Yeah, great. Done. <laughs> right, so now, yeah. now let's move into retail. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is just, uh, it was really an example of a recent transformation around kind of that omni-channel experience that all organizations want and have challenges around. Yeah. And this is from CX Dive. And the headline is how the vitamin shop builds flexible customer experiences. And it was really a story about the upgrade to their point of sale system and their kind of digital landscape. But what stood out to me about it was that when one of the things that they're very proud of that they wanted to talk about was this idea that now if somebody's in the store and they go up to the point of sale system, their loyalty 
uh, program can be recognized and they can really sign up for different things there. So I think it's a great example of how so many organizations are still kind of living with legacy systems uh. that are siloed, that aren't really about the customer journey, that are about like marketing probably owns that loyalty program, right? Mm. And then the point of sale system, that's probably operations or field operations or what have you. Mm. But the part about this that they mentioned at the very end of this article was really about how, oh, this took a lot of cross-functional communication and uh, building on the actual experience within. Yeah. And this is something I see over and over again is that we are sometimes so focused on this like ideal project of we're going to roll out this omni-channel thing. We literally forget to include the people who are on the front lines who will yeah. be the ones delivering it. So I think that when we think about big projects like this, mm. you know, we talked about change management and we've talked about these things it's really about also including these groups and these people early enough in the process so that they can have a say in, well, that doesn't make sense, right? Like we might not be able to do that. Right. So, you know, with your kind of perspective, I'm just curious, like what are those cross-functional communication mm. gotchas? Yes. <laughs> I mean, anything like that. Oh, Lordy. This is a huge <laughs> topic, Jeannie. And you know, I know. It. Um, I know. Sorry. So, I mean, that that is that is a thing that I have seen from my own work. And even though it's not focused so much on customer experience per se, like that's I mean, I see that all the time when it comes to just even the core messaging of a company. Right. Where, you know, leadership says one thing, the you know, the the frontline experience is something else and the customer's experience yet a third thing. Yep. Um, and so and I and and I think that you know, counterintuitively, there is a quote unquote good reason for it, or at least there's an understandable reason. I don't think it's necessarily a you know positive reason. And, and that is, is that we, we so operate from what we wish were true mm -hmm. <laughs> that we kind of forget that what we're, that what anybody experiences is what is actually true. And it's that perception of that experience that is what's, what's there. And I think if you just ask people to stop for a moment and think about those assumptions. And I know that sounds like kind of a weird thing to ask people to stop, but, but in, you know, before brand, before strategy, and I know based on what we were talking about before we were started recording, mm -hmm. you know, part of like how I think about mindset is what is the actual operating philosophy of this company? Mm -hmm. Like meaning, all right, are, is it okay with us if the thing that we're putting in place to make our lives easier for our customers, it actually makes lives for our team members that have to mm -hmm. deliver it harder. Does that yeah. make sense to us? Are we comfortable with that? Because oftentimes, like, that's actually where once we can establish some really, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of work, frankly, nor does it take a lot of time to say, let's reverse engineer because whatever's in place is actually representative of kind of what, what those values are that are actually used, not the ones that are said. So yeah. I think to your point of bringing those people in, not just on the conversation about like, how do we implement this, but all the way back from why do we think this change makes sense in the first place? Mm -hmm. Why do we believe that? Like, why does, I mean, it's going to start with management, I am sure, fine. And then have a conversation, kind of a tiering conversation as we go down in those levels of the organization, assuming a traditional hierarchical structure, where we're saying, okay, this is why we believe it makes sense. If we do this, we're going to get this outcome. And now let's explain, based on our beliefs, principles, mm -hmm. values that we actually hold, and you can see us holding in practice, here's why we think this approach will deliver on that. Not here's all the extra benefits and all the features it has. Why do we think this foundational approach to this, mm -hmm. like this question will solve that? And you test at that level because ultimately it's that level of acceptance that precedes everything else. Yeah. Do Does everybody agree in principle that this should work, right? And you can, uh, humans are actually really good at assessing on that level, whether or not that argument checks out. Mm -hmm. And yep. so you save everybody, not only a lot of time, 
but a huge amount of money because sometimes the things that stop an initiative like this in its tracks are a very basic assumption that somebody points out way too late. Yep. Right. Yep. And that's the thing you're trying to surface as early as possible. And I think the other part of that is, you know, we not only make assumptions, but we also, um, we, we think if it works on paper, it's going to work. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and then you actually test it and see how things are working. And that actually can guide some of your broader communications about it, because that's when you start thinking about, wow, we didn't, we didn't give instructions here. That's why this isn't working. Or we didn't actually think about the next step mm. of, okay, now people are signed up for the loyalty program. Are we emailing them about it? Are they, you know, do we have a pamphlet? What are we doing? Yeah. And so I think really um, it's, it's kind of this mix of thinking about the actual activities, behaviors, all of those things, and how can communication and cross-functional leadership really support that? Because I've heard so many horror stories about, especially technology rollouts. Oh, um, I can only imagine. And they can go to the field. And then one of the examples that uh, I've talked about before we, we were part of was this group that had, you know, guys in trucks and they would go out and they had their clipboard and then they started using the handheld uh, technology. Yep. And what they realized was they couldn't do, they couldn't really get the results they wanted with adoption without really getting some leadership within the field of peers. Like it was mm. peer it, uh, communication worked much more effectively because they were able to say, I know what happens, right? Like, I know you're sitting in the, in the driveway and you're filling out all this stuff. This is going to make that faster for you. This is what, so they really understood the benefits for those team members. And I think that's something that we, sometimes forget yeah. when we're at that higher level too. And that's an important point because it isn't just the benefits. They understood the rationale, right, mm -hmm. of that. And, and you know, I use that term hesitantly, uh, hesitatingly, <laughs> um, because it's, I mean, it sounds, we think when we talk about benefits that we're actually talking about rationale and we're not. Like mm -hmm. that's actually not the same thing. I mean, the way I look at it, the benefits are really just another way to articulate what is the outcome that we're trying to get. We're trying mm -hmm. to get this thing and guess what? You're going to get all these other things. And then when we try to say, okay, well, what are we doing? And we're like, but it's got all these features. That's just another way of saying, like it's just a more micro way of saying we're going to make this change. But we leave out why these features would produce those benefits in theory, right? Yep. Based on our own experience. And because I don't care if you're in the field or leadership, whose experience do you trust the most? Mm -hmm. Your own. Mm -hmm. So when something comes down without something that checks that intuitive experiential box, you are running uphill with any implementation effort. And I'm not even talking about change. It's just because it's like, we have to use communication in order to get that rationale out there. Mm -hmm. But it really does start to say, what have we done to make sure this is going to check that intuitive experiential box that, that is what any piece of evidence or explanation or feature and benefit is going to have to run through. We use it as a filter for the information that we're going to listen to after that. Mm. And so yeah. it's just, you know, the, but anyway, I could I could go on and on. I'm going to hold back. I'm going to hold back. But I think that's the major point is just that we don't we we think our intuitive belief about something is enough. But mm -hmm. in the re in the reverse situation, we wouldn't take it from somebody else. Right. 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 And so it's basically saying, well, given the people that you're trying to implement, whose experience, whose intuition are they going to trust? Yes. Their own. So yes. we need to figure out a way to make this intuitively make sense to them. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is going to be a, what sounds like a logical explanation, but it still needs to be from their point of view. The yes. things that are going to align with what they see day to day, day in and day out. Yes. Totally agree. Totally agree. And I think that like intuition is not something we always talk about in business. And it's so important. It's so important. And really understanding how people are receiving information, how they are perceiving mm. the trust level, I think, of, hey, is this good for me or not? And yeah. that all gets woven into this. So now I'm going to bring it all together. Ready? Yeah. So this last article is from Soch Pub. 
because of course it is, uh, how businesses can cultivate a customer-centric culture during natural disasters. And what I found kind of interesting about this was we are, I'm experiencing this a little bit real time because one of our clients right now is the city of Tampa. Ooh, and they have yeah. been through it, right, in the last few weeks. Sure and witnessing what they have to do to get things stood up very quickly, to respond. It's been, I mean, it's really heroic. It really is. Um, the people who stay overnight and do the things that they need to do to take care of their citizens, it's really, um, it's just been kind of amazing to witness. And one of the things that I found very interesting about this article was really thinking through, like, we are going to have to deal with this. This mm -hmm. is just part of our world now. We have more natural disasters. They're more severe. They're expanding um, in kind of their geography. And so a lot of times we have to think about things like, well, our office might be fine, but what if we have a mm -hmm. server farm somewhere else? What if yeah. we have a supply chain disruption? Yeah. What if we have all of these different things that can really impact the customer experience? And so I think when we talked about, you know, with the first article about you have to be proactive and really have a plan in place. And then also think about how do we actually make sure that any way that people are reaching out to us, that we are available to them, thinking through that omni-channel experience as well, it really comes together in something like this and serving people in natural disasters. So this is a little bit of crisis communications as well. So I'm just curious, like what if you had that magic wand of, you know, if we did this perfectly, yeah. what are some of the ways that you would recommend? Okay. Well, one thing that stood out to me about that thing was how do we cultivate this culture during a natural yeah. disaster? I'm like, step one, too late. <laughs> um, yeah. Honestly, and I, I know that's bad news, but the thing to, the thing to understand is that I mean, I love. I was quickly trying to see if I could find the 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 source for it, and I, I can't. But we'll try to figure it out later. Which is that there is um, an author who recently wrote a book within the last, I think, two or three years, who made a distinction between kind of skills and traits, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a new distinction. But what this person was pointing out was that the traits are the things that show up under stress, mm -hmm. and. So th that, if for no other reason, is the reason why cultivating a culture, you know, customer centric culture during the crisis is not the time to do it yep. because that's when a whole different set of, of traits kind of comes out because we don't have the same, frankly, capacity to process things at the same level when we're dealing, when we're in crisis mode. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that gets just to you know, something again, we were talking about before we started to hit record, like, you know, dual process theory, like when you're under anxiety, when you're in stress, when you are in those kind of high arousal states, you, you really cannot make mm -hmm. rational decisions. And so this is why it is so important to do this beforehand. Um, or if you hadn't done it beforehand to take the lessons of what happened during crisis and then start to figure out what a what does that reveal about like what did our behavior as an organization reveal about the actual traits that are driving how we go about things right mm -hmm. and as mm -hmm. you said this has been for your client this has been heroic you've actually seen this like incredible community minded mindset that now mm -hmm. is part of the experience that people have so you know, I'm, I, I hope I don't sound like, you know, somebody with a hammer and everything looks like a nail here, but <laughs> it really does come back to saying, you know, fa fundamentally, what is our, what is our organization here to do? What is the big question that it answers? Mm -hmm. And I fi far prefer that framing than what's the problem that we solve. Yeah. Um, that also has to do with a kind of a funny cognitive loop here is that by simply by framing it as a question that you answer, you not only include the problem that you solve, but you actually open up people's, um, the way people think about possible solutions to be much, much broader. Mm -hmm. And everybody mm -hmm. says they want innovation. So let's not like shut down the channels for that before it starts. So really answering that question, like what is your client's purpose in all of this? Like mm -hmm. what is the question they're trying to, to answer? And that can change, you know, it, kind of um, situation by situation. But stepping back, you can say, well, globally, when we're not in crisis, what is the thing that we're here to right. do? 
And right. what do we as an organization, based on our behaviors, can we reverse engineer? Can we excavate and say that these are actually the operating principles of the business? Not the aspirational ones, not the right. ones that we say, but the ones that we're actually governing what we do. Right. Um, so Jim Duterte out of the University of Virginia calls these the deep rules of organizations. And he's using them in a slightly different context, but I think that's a, a nice um, kind of understandable, mm -hmm. plain English way to get some of these complicated concepts. But I think uh, that is what it's about, right? And mm -hmm. even if you haven't done that work and find yourself in the middle of a crisis, I think it's worth taking an hour. And I... Yeah. And this is what I have seen with the work that I do with clients. You really can get extraordinary clarity in an hour. Mm -hmm. of what is our kind of guiding principle here? What is the kind of what's the purpose mission? Like, what are we trying to do? I know the army used to call it commander's intent, but one of my classmates in my doctoral program, like two of them are actual army rangers and they, I, they haven't told me what the updated thing is yet, but <laughs> it's that idea of like, what's the big question we're trying to answer and give us like two pillars, honestly, yep anymore and they can't remember it that's right and and so this i think is part of the problem with so many organizational strategies implementation plans brand things mm -hmm. like kind of your core brand documents as well is that they are so flipping complicated yeah yeah that, and they're so detailed because we're trying to be comprehensive that they're not actually comprehensible Meaning, right. <laughs> you know, the, the analogy I like to use, I'm still trying to find a bigger one, but it's basically like we're serving everybody like a spaghetti and meatball dinner, fully cooked all at once with no bowl. And we're like, <laughs> eat it in one bite. And that's not yeah. possible. Right. Right. So it's basically about saying like, OK, how can we give you the end of the noodle? Right. Like and then and then we're going to build on that. Mm -hmm. And like I said, at any moment is is never too late to step back and say, what are we going to stand for in this moment? Yep. And then use that and, and keep it tight, right? Again, don't turn it into 16 levels and visions mm -hmm. and value statements and like start there, start there, and then use that to, to build and contextualize all the things that you do from do. After. Yeah. Yeah. And we do something with our clients called a CX mission statement. And part of it is because they would show like, look at all of our values and vision and all that. And number one, sometimes they never mention the customer. They, <laughs> they never think about the customer. And yeah. number two, like to your point, there was no way to, in, to really access what was most important yeah. for the customer experience. And the hardest part about it is keeping it concise. They always want to add 17 bullets and all of yeah. that. And, you know, we try to keep it a sentence or two and, and part of that is because there are also trade-offs when you're talking about values and you're talking about your promise Absolutely. and you can't always be the fastest and the most accurate, right? No. Like you and have those to... are, And those are table stakes, right? Because right. if you're not fast and if you're not accurate, right? Right. Like right. then what are you even doing? Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, you know, mission statements, that's a whole nother topic for us, Jeannie. Yeah. <laughs> um, cause my, the first 15 years of my career were in, were in nonprofits. And so. Oh. I have thoughts. I, I mean, bet, the mission I statements bet. are wonderful because they do they do capture the aspiration, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and you're right. We because they're aspirational, I think is part of why we start to put all the stuff in. Um, and so, yeah, the work that I do with clients is like I'm ruthless, <laughs> and I'm like, y'all better ready to like cut because this is what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And really, like it, it does come down to that because what I really want an organization to be able to say is, w you know, we believe that, you know, uh, accountability, I'm using a client mm -hmm. example here with permission. Um, we believe that accountability is the ownership of outcomes and we believe success requires execution at scale. Mm -hmm. That's why in order to ensure that we are ready for this big strategic shift that we're about to make, our job, job number one is to scale accountability through the organization. Mm -hmm. Everybody on board, great. Then you go to the next layer. It's almost yep. like, yep. I think it was yep. like Google Earth, right? Like this is the big like overview map that says we're going from point A to point B, mm -hmm. destination check, 
everybody agree where we are, where we are? Everybody agree about where we're going? Great. Now, once we've got the kind of general route mapped out, let's get more specific, more specific, more specific, so that it's only after you've checked that understanding and agreement at each of those levels, mm -hmm. right? Can you start to do the equivalent of what we usually do right of the way, which is the equivalent of the turn by turn directions and in 500 feet turn left. Right. When right, it's like, right. but if I don't even know what continent I'm on and that's I don't know, exactly even know right. where I'm going, well, why would I? Right? right. And so that's what this is all about. It's really about finding the simplest, strongest articulation of what is guiding your behaviors mm -hmm. and thoughts right now. Yep. Right. If yep. you don't like it, We'll worry about that later, but it's like it, you have to start in order to build that trust we were talking about mm -hmm. from that point of view of what people are actually experiencing because anything else, any gap between their actual experience and that aspirational statement mm -hmm. is going to erode trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Full stop. And I think the, the thing that I see a lot in customer experience is that it's very tempting to just start with tactics, right? To just start with like, let's check this box and check this box. And then after a while, everybody looks around and says, why are we doing this? What is what is happening? What is this all right. connected to? And so I I love the Google Earth example because that's really what it's about. It's about figuring out who who are we, what's most important. Where are we? Where, where, are, we where, going? where are we going? <laughs> yeah. 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 And then and then we can figure out the turn by turn. So exactly. well, we have had so much fun and <laughs> I hope that all of you listening out there have appreciated all the wisdom that Tamsin has brought to our discussion today. So thank you so much, Tamsin, for being here. Oh my here. gosh, this was super fun. I don't, I don't often get to like, you know, go back to my, to my <laughs> master's degree in like crisis communications. And, and so this is like super fun. I'm like, yay, this is super. <laughs> um, but again, like it's so much of a background in marketing is, you know, it's, it's, it's customer experience adjacent and mm -hmm, that's, you sure. know, and I think so many of the things that you're talking about when you're talking about go straight to implementation, check all the boxes, mm -hmm. you know, I could see that, you know, back in the early parts of my career, with the very same thing. People are like, well, yep. do we have a website? Can we make it green? Like, let's right. make it spin. And it's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yep. Like, does it matter if it's green or spinning if the people we are trying to talk to would never understand or agree with it in the first place? Right. No. Yep. So really to me, like that, it is like, that is the, the that is like my kind of call mm -hmm. to arms, right? Like yes. um, to say, listen, we've just, we need to start there. We need to start with mm -hmm. what we're do doing, why we're doing it that way yeah. and what we can stand a hundred percent behind as our justification for that. And it's yeah. not data. It's right. not data. It's right. a logical explanation of our beliefs. Yes. Well, I think you and I are going to lead the charge there. We've yes. got, Let's we've got, it. we're on the horse. We're, we're riding out. So, <laughs> Well, thank you for being here. And, My pleasure. Uh, you know, I know we'll talk again very soon. I'm sure so. we will. I'm looking forward to it. All right. <laughs> thanks so much, Jeannie. Thank you. And thank you for being here, for listening and for watching with us. And thank you for all the work you do as customer experience leaders. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is an unusual episode once a month that we do. But Overall, I'm here to answer your questions. So please leave me a voicemail at askgenie.vip and I will answer your question on the podcast. Keep learning, keep leading, and I will see you next time.